Reginald and Stanford, a delightful audio title from Wisdom Twins Books, free of charge. Arthur J. Stanford, known simply as Stanford to his friends, visited Dr. Breadthroat every Tuesday to go over his many problems. During this particularly bad era, he had even visited him bi-weekly, paying his loyal psychiatrist a hefty sum of money to cancel any other appointments so he could have all his time for the full afternoon. Come in. Afternoon, Dr. Breadthroat. Charmed, I'm sure. Likewise, Stanford. Do take a seat on the couch, dear boy. Oh, thank you, Dr. Breadthroat. What, what? Oh. You look troubled, Stanford. Is everything okay? Certainly not. Dr. Breadthroat, certainly not. I'm having a bad time of it. A very bad time, indeed. But as you may know, life is not always a smooth running ride now, is it? Certainly not, Stanford. Has your wife held, uh, you know? Left me? Not yet. But she soon will be. I mean, what can I do about it? It's been going to happen for a while now. Inevitable, Doctor, inevitable. Although life is often a fun, leisurely stroll through a consequence-free environment, when one can use one's money to get absolutely blind drunk and care not of any responsibilities, it also has its fair share of bone-shattering tragedy. Even though I do feel melancholy, I do have my loyal butler Crawford to see me through the problems. The other day I almost wept. Almost. And I rang my little sofa-side bell to summon my loyal but well-paid manservant. In he slid, as if on some invisible skateboard like a youth would have. Some saviour on wheels. Yes, Stanford? he asked patiently awaiting my request with hands held sweetly together, as if praying. I am feeling blue, Crawford, I replied, with the melancholy smoke permeating from my haunted mouth. Oh, dear sir, so sorry to hear that. And how blue, indeed, may I ask? Unusually blue, Crawford. As blue as the time your mother beat you with a rolled-up Times literary supplement until you wept, he asked bringing distant, shut-away memories back to the forefront of my poor, troubled mind. Perhaps so, Crawford, I admitted. Crawford gasped, realizing the seriousness I was holding within me. Perhaps bluer than then, Crawford, I said. Maybe even bluer than ever before. Crawford was so stunned by my words that he had stopped breathing for a few seconds, and visibly had to shake himself back out of his catatonic state. Crawford, man, stop bumbling, you klutz, I said, throwing a freshly baked treacle tart right into his face, a perfect shot by anyone's standards, which was still piping hot, as Chef Wanamaker had just pulled it from the oven. I saw Crawford try so hard not to scream in total utter agony, and his face turned a harsh red as the hot treacle ran down his contorted face. The agony within was clearly wanting to externalize itself outwards but I had put a strict rule in Crawford's contract not to cry, shriek, or howl when I was to inflict pain on him, which I had promised would be quite frequent. He knew this, as it was the 4.5 clause in his contract, and having been made aware of my mental problems in the past, he accepted there would be violence and signed on the dotted line. Now he was obviously desperate to scream in discomfort, did you hear what I said, man, I said, in showing that the loyal but simple servant was back in the real world hopefully gotten over his painful moment of scalding. Yes, I heard you, sir, he finally replied, smearing crust from his face. If you are bluer than on the previously mentioned occasion, sir, he said, then I fear what your upcoming actions may be. Will you not go on your yacht again for two weeks, sir, on an almighty drunken binge, like the last time you felt blue, then return with seaweed in your hair and a vengeful power that you would take out on me, sir? I hate to sound selfish, but I do not wish for you to soundly smite me down again, sir. Were it not Crawford, I eased with delicately chosen words. I saw the relief appear on his face instantly. I have not the energy to thrash you, nor do I have a daily rack of suitable weight to roll up and beat you with. No, I feel down in the dumps, dear Crawford. So down in the dumps that I feel my grandfather may be needed. Oh, forgive me, sir, but you must be ever so melancholy, suggested Crawford not knowing half of it. Grandfather is only ever needed if you are near suicidal, sir. 
Go fetch grandfather, would you? I said, half ordering the man with harsh carelessness, but pretending to be too weak with upset to fully do the job properly. I felt the anger rise in my neck like some venomous serpent. Crawford left the room, of course, with a stiff, almost haunted look about him. He knew I was alone. I would never ask for grandfather until I was inconsolable. Grandfather, by then nearing one hundred years old, took shelter in my linen cupboard. He was a small man, and in fact gotten smaller over the past two decades he had been living in that cupboard. His sole role in his now somewhat limited existence was to cheer me up when I was feeling blue. True, it wasn't much of a life for him, but he did get regular meals at 8.30, dead on one in the afternoon, and between 5 and 6 on an evening. He also had the right to a bathroom break at any point between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Unless, of course, I was asleep and didn't want to be awoken by an ancient half-wit like himself, wandering off to the loo at some godforsaken hour. Within twenty seconds I was counting, of course, by the tick of my antique pocket watch, Crawford returned with my tiny grandfather, leaning over so slightly in order to hold his brittle old hand. His glasses, large framed things, dwarfed his small face, and I couldn't help but think that the man, with his curly patch of grey hairs on his chest, peeking out from his shirt, coupled with his hunched stance, resembled an ageing retired showbiz ape being brought out to please the applauding stars of some glittery awards show. Grandfather, I am blue, I said, leaning forward in my chair and holding on to his little hands. Dead-eyed, he peered back, reaching blankly into his pocket and pulling out a packet of toffees. Handing me one, I gave a sudden smile, and I put it in my mouth, and I was instantly eased by his beautiful offering. That will be all, Grandfather, I said, almost weeping. With that, I nodded my head to Crawford, who then calmly took Grandfather away, back to his cupboard. I almost wept as Grandfather walked out of the room, peering over his little shoulder at me as he disappeared from sight, rather like a little boy entering the building on his first day at school. Still, Grandfather could not totally rid my being of this heavy sadness. It felt like a ton of weight on my slender yet slightly muscular shoulders. The muscular shoulders are a result of the odd workout I do, as I have a personal gym over on the west wing of my house. So bad a pressure on me that not even two bottles of sherry a day could lift it. My wife of twenty-three years, Hilda, was leaving me that week, but that wasn't the thing that really got me down in the dumps. There were other things, things that tore at my heart, ripped away my pride and shat on my sense of well-being. The worst thing imaginable had actually happened. The mayor and mayoress of Smoochieville had turned down my invitation. I was holding a dinner party, in aid of some ridiculous call, which I was using as an excuse to boost my profile among the more respected circles in town. It was just a cover to get some aristocrats round, some conservative MPs to have a good chortle and wine taste with, and get my face in a paper, of course, a face that, although clearly ageing, was ever full of character and wonderment. People flocked to my parties, obviously keen to divulge in the finer things of life, laugh about what struggles those beneathers might be undertaking that night, and delight in the face of my immortal charisma. But when the mayor and his sluttish wife, who is almost twenty years his junior, by the way, declined my monumental event due to them being busy opening a ward in some run-down hospital specialising with the working class, I was overcome with such a rage I had no option but to send out one of my servants to the shop where he bought the largest, thickest newspaper he could find. He would then bring it back to me, leave the room sharpish, where I rolled it up into the tightest form I could thus increasing its pain potential, and ran around the house, thrashing anyone who crossed my raging path. Now, you may see my reaction is somewhat over the top, but you obviously do not mix in the circles I do. A snub from the mayor, and as I described her, his sluttish wife, is like a slap in the social face, a humiliating spanking on the arse of public status. I was angrier still, as I knew for a fact that they hadn't turned down the invite earlier that month from Sir Arthur Beaumont a young upstart I once had tried to set up with my youngest daughter. The man is not much of a conversationalist or a raconteur, but one hell of a fox-hunter, I must admit. The way he gets those hounds worked up, I tell you, it's a sight to be cherished. This aside, the mayor and his female hussy of an accomplice had gone along that night, and a positively brilliant time was had. So it said in the paper the next day, anyway. It was a devastating blow to my self-esteem. I'd been mocked in the upper-class circles that week, made a fool of so much so that I cancelled the party altogether and spent it in a dark mood, all alone, relegating Hilda to the east wing of the house so I could drink in peace. The next day, of course, she announced her resignation from this most rocky of marriages. 
I had attempted to calm things down, offering her a thousand pounds and spending money and a kiss on the lips that evening, but she politely declined. Well, I say politely. She had actually cursed unpleasantly at me, causing me to throw the towel in. To add further insult to the verbal bollocking I had just taken, she spat on my back as I left the room. As I tutted and shut the door behind me, I heard her sob like an orphan in the third of our many lounges. I wouldn't care, but had the spittle missed me and landed on the wall, I would have been a very cross man indeed. We had just had it redecorated, me forking out the money, of course, and frankly, I wasn't prepared to undergo the hell of it all again. The decorator, who had papered it, was little more than a working-class oik, smelling of fish fingers and reeking of desperation, especially when the end of his working day came, and he awaited the money from yours truly, <clears throat> licking lips and rubbing his oily hands together like Fagin. I promised myself I would never hire that man again. Anyway, Hilda said I didn't care about her, and had no time for her at all. Perhaps the latter had some truth in it, but she wasn't one to fully understand the amount of responsibility I had on my shoulders. The mayor and his whore of a wife had shunned me, publicly, and I was filled with a deep, heavy tumour of rejection. But Hilda was selfishly hogging my attention, trying to tell me that I wasn't spending enough time with her. Why do you not care for me, Stanford? You terrible blackguard! Why has it all gone sour? Can't you even spare one night a week for me, you utter bounder? She had argued. Of course, I had to remind her of my social dramas and, of course, the horrors of running Stanford, the company that had been in my family since the 1700s, a place which was full of drama day in, day out. Even though I only went in once a week, normally to see how it was all going, sack a few people, and hold a meeting to discuss, well, whatever, I was still under great, heavy, almost crippling amounts of pressure. Seeing millions of pounds entering one's bank account every year can be quite overwhelming, you know. Daunting, in fact. People never think of that side of it all. My assistant, Francis Pollock, is a jolly good chap. And although his piggish snout of a nose suggests a family of inbreeding, it doesn't stop him being a damn fine right-hand man. If things are tough on the day I am at work, and I want to blow off some steam, he'll ask me sweetly if I'd like my gun loading up. If I am particularly full of rage and I nod my head blankly, still staring into space, he will calmly stroll to the gun cupboard in my office, pull out one of the rifles, load it up, and place my hunting hat firmly on my head for me. Now go out there, he says, and let it all out. Go home afterwards and put your feet up. I'll see to everything here, old chap. He pats me on the shoulder. He's a good man. I dream of what innocent creature I might be taking out of this reliable firearm. And hey-ho, once I have a car boot crammed full of helpless dead animals, ready for the skinning, I find myself eased once again, returning to my humble yet massive abode. Every week, Stanford would meet with his friend Reginald in Braithwaite's Gentleman's Club. A delightful time would be had. Hello, Reginald. Hello, Stamford, old chap. Nice to see you, old chap. Oh, nice yeah. to see you, old chap. Can I a tiffin? Well, I wouldn't say no. Two whiskies, immediately. Yes, and Harry our barman. Look at his trousers. They're not tailor-made. He's new, isn't he? I think he's new. I've never seen him before. That's not Trevor. Quicker, quick. Come on, boy. Quicker. Quick. That's working, it. Thank you. Thank you. Class, Can you get Cheers. Cheers. Chin, old boy. Having a good, good week, old chap. Oh. Don't even ask, dear boy, don't even ask. I'm out of problem. Well, there's been a drama at work again. I say drama, more of a tragedy, dear boy. Mm. Well, we got the annual figures for the profits of the business. Yes, pray tell. This year, we only had a 120% profit. Compared to last year's, 200% profit. Oh, sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. So, I was full of rage, of course, and hit a couple of people with the rolled-up Guardian. With the Guardian, of course. Yes, yeah. and... Um, it's a good weapon. Oh, the yeah. choice of weapons. And um, I looked at the figures and I realised that for this year, my bonus is only going to be 600 grand. Oh dear. Well, well I was well, devastated. What's well, a trifling amount? Yes, I mean, it's pathetic really. It's barely enough to buy a mansion. Well, you know, you could only buy a six or seven, eight bedroom house for that, right? Mm, yeah, so, of yeah. course, I um, retired to the bathroom to weep. Uh, I felt low. I've never felt so low. <laughs> Not like you, Stanford. You're a man of action. Surely you didn't stay that way for too long. I only wept for a few seconds, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I said, We can get through this, Stanford. Get through it. So 
So I went outside and I had ten staff members sacked. Which, of course, put my bonus back up to a million. Excellent work. <laughs> I grabbed them by the scruff of their neck and I ordered them to get out! Of course they wept. Of course they wept. Yeah. They always do. But I so enjoy seeing them weep. Chin chin, dear boy. Uh, chin chin, Stamford, old chap. Yes, yeah, delightful. Down the apt, you know, that old chap. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, I had a little bit of a... came to work this morning with a bit of a headache. Oh, yes, dear Stupid mind. wife upset me. Oh, what the hell are to do now? I was simply reading the Times, and I looked up and said, Oh, I fancy some time in Saint-Tropez. A bit of a holiday, dear boy. Oh, a bit of a holiday, a bit of a break. Just a couple of weeks. To so sit and enjoy the sun. And uh, the wife, she turned to me and said, Oh, that sounds nice. I look forward to that. I said, not you, you stupid woman, the mistress. <laughs> stupid woman. Delightful, dear boy. Stupid woman. So I rolled the times up, give her a slap around the head with it. I said, no, you place, woman. The mistress, if it was you, would be going to Cleethorpe's. Yes. Stupid woman. Of course you wept. <laughs> <laughs> Like your typical pair of delightful squires, Stanford and Reginald also enjoyed a riverside picnic. On a sunny day, of course. Oh, dear boy, there's nothing worse than a hangover. Hmm, true, 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 Stanford. I had one at the weekend, it was awful. You see, Lot of fun getting one, though. <laughs> yeah, it was a delightful one. Well, I, I had, I, I, it caused the hangover, it was the gather event I attended the night before, with the mayor and mayoress of Smoochieville. It was delightful. Excellent. But it was, it, I was rubbing shoulders with the rich and the famous, the mm. Uh, mm. pillars of the community. The mm. event was ruined by one member who had been invited, a member of the working class. It was... Oh. We didn't have to talk to him, did you? Well, he, he had pulled through some god-awful disease, so he was being honoured that night for a Ooh. bravery award, and I didn't really think it was necessary. Ooh, I mean, so a dirty working class It was a person. dirty working class person. With a disease. Oh, oh, my word. What? Anyway, the, a great evening was had. Every time he tried to talk to me, the working class oik, mm. I looked away sharpish, and this, they, there's a strange smell from them. It's like barbecue. It's I think they have barbecues every weekend, I've heard, in their gardens. It's the smell of need and want. Anyway, it was good night. You know, I got blasted. And all Excellent. This, and the mistress was there. The wife was at home. Mm. The wife spoiled the occasion. Oh, exactly. So anyway, <clears throat> I woke up her over. <clears throat> the night before, I had ordered the wife, Hilda. I'd said... When I wake up, I don't want you anywhere near me this morning. Mm. And so I'd relegated her to the west side of the house, mm. which is over a mile away. Mm. I mean, mm. I never go there. It's so vast. My mm. home is mm. so vast and all the acres of land. Yes, yes. And I said, mm. stay in that house out of the house. I don't want to see you. The part of the house that still needs renovating? Yes, that's yeah. the part. Best that's place for it's, her. It's very cold and damp, but yes, it's, yes. it's good enough for her. Good enough for her. Delightful. I'll give us your glass here, Bob. <laughs> nice one. Yes. And uh, anyway, I got up and I thought, what's better to get rid of the hangover than a nice cup of hot tea? Oh, damn. Looked in the pot. No tea bags. Oh, dear. Um, oh, dear. I thought you'd, I know, d drat. Oh, blast. Uh, mm. Sugar crumbs. Oh, golly. Mm. Gosh, I'm going to have to go down to the store because you know, I, my staff were off. It was a Saturday and I had to get the rolls out, not the black one. I had to be no, waxed by a peasant. I shop on your by yourself. You know, I was frightened. I mean, the, the convenience store, there's nothing mm. convenient about the fucking place. It's a mile away from fucking my home. Miles away from Way out of my yes. acres of land. Well, I had to go mixing with, mm. in the streets with these people. With the smelly working class. Yeah, they've all got hunched over backs, mm. hung over and in a complete mess, you know, completely traumatic situation. I was weeping, mm. almost weeping. Mm. I never weep, but really, unless it's really necessary. As I am a man, men do not weep, as you know. But it must have been terrifying having all those working class people around. Well, they were peering at me, they were looking at me, and Ugh. they were trying to speak to me. One said, hello, governor. Oh, Stanford, it's I making thought, me am, gag. It's said, making me gag, Stanford. Yes, sorry, but it's true. I said, I am not a governor. You nothing. I am not a governor. Anyway, convenience stores there. I go in. There they are, the tea bags. Quickly, I darted to the shelf. I avoided eye contact altogether. Terrified beyond my wits. What, I mean, working class, they fight. You know, you could have swung from me. I don't know what he's going to do. In unpredictable. Always drunk. Mm. You know, we drink. But we, I don't drink to excess. Well, most of the most of the conversations the working class have are, A, 
What are you looking at? Yes, and uh, did you watch the footy? And on me head, son. <laughs> or, you know, oh, goal, smashing, go get the lager. Yes. So, any so anyway, I <laughs> such nonsense, dribble. Dribble, dribble. Uh, ran for the tea bags, took them to the counter, didn't look at him. How, how much, how much? And, uh, I was in a frenzy. And he says, that's £2.50, governor. Ugh. Calling me governor. What a trifling what amount. Yes. So I, well, I've never heard of £2.50. I can't, but I took a 20 out. Here, keep, keep the change. Mainly for the reason I didn't want to touch hands with him when we were passing the change back and forth. No, 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 no. Keep the 20, keep the change. You should have seen his face. It lit up like a fuck bulb. He was so happy, you know. He said, oh, are you sure, Governor? I said, yes, 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 I'm How sure. fucking tedious. It was very grateful, and he put it in the till, and he gave me a smile. Of course he wept. Of course. And I left, and it's nice to give something back to the peasants. That's what I always say, give a bit back. Stanford. What? I too had a simply dreadful Sunday morning. Really? It is, I'm afraid so. I had a very good night out on the uh, Saturday with yes. a mistress and her children. Oh yes. Well, they um, are children. Aren't they? Well, yes, of course. Yeah. Illegitimate. Of course, yes. little bastard. Never announced. Never, never verified. Uh, I'm afraid I had too much champagne. Oh dear boy. And uh, I said to Rosemary, "Don't wake me till nine o five." Yeah. I'm afraid to say that at nine o'clock I was shaken by Rosemary and awakened. At what? At nine o'clock. Having you already told her to wake you up at nine o five. The hard word. The heart. She wakes me. The tray with tea, toast, bacon, eggs. Oh, of course, I threw the the bloody lot straight in the air and rubbed the egg in her face. Said you stupid woman. It's nine o'clock. How oh, dare she wake I you told up you nine oh five. Of course, I rolled a guardian into a into a club shape, beat her around the head several times, and say, when I say nine oh five, I mean nine oh five. You stupid woman. Yes. Of course she wept. Oh well, of course she did. A lot. Anyone would. I mean, if you if you roll that paper up tight enough, it's a very painful weapon. Mm. Mm. If it hadn't have been for the weeping. My Sunday would have been completely ruined. Really? But it lifted it bearable. Out of five, how good was your Sunday? Mm, three. Three? Mm. Uh, Very without poor. the weeping, what, it would probably been a two or a oh, one. Oh, without the weeping, two. I mean, a, wee, a good weep from a peasant or someone lesser than us. Mm, the wife. Re yes, the wife. Mm. Really lifts a day. I mean, one of my peasants, I think it was the gardener. I never speak to him. He did something wrong. I can't remember what it was. I think he spoke to me. Only speak to me through the wife. Through the same wife. Same as I. Same as I. Well, I say, you want to talk... On his first day, the arrogant oik, with his fingers covered in mud. Oh, he Governor, smells. where do you want yeah. me to put the weeds? I said, <laughs> how dare you speak to me? Speak to the wife and she'll pass the message through. I'm too much of a busy man. Oh. No, I was, I was in the study drinking sherry, you see. I'm too busy for this nonsense. This gardener, it upset me. Uh, I was forced to, to roll up a copy of The Guardian and I rolled it up tight and I beat him round soundly. Good choice of weapon. You know, rapid movements. I, I was, I was on a, f I was just so full of rage that I couldn't stop. And I wrapped it tight as I could, so it was hard. And every time I hit him, his face became more contorted, more and more screwed up. He, he seemed to be aging by every strike of my guardian. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, his face looked like a straitjacket. It, it, it's all the blood I deserve speaking to you out of turn. But the rage disappeared. I, after I, I stood over his weeping wreck of a body, mm. having beaten him with the Guardian, yeah. and I felt superb. Mm. I, I, I felt mm. euphoric. Lifted to a... Euphoric. Yes. And then I said, take the rest of the afternoon off, peasant. Mm. Of course you told the wife to tell him to have the rest of the day. I told the wife. To tell him to have the day. You know, day. and uh, he was grateful. Mm. Mm. Of course he wept. Oh, of course. But it was a mixture of uh, pain and uh, mm. gratefulness, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Thankfulness. Mm. The wanty, needy peasant gardener. Oh, a funny thing happened the other day. Oh, well, pray well, tell, Stonford. I say funny. It was more distressing for me, really. Mm. I was in the east wing of the home. Mm. I was. Uh, I was in one of my weird moods. You know the moods I have mm. when I want to drink until I can't move, until the sherry mm. drips from my eyes. Practicing taxidermy. 
Yes. Mm. And, you know, I was sat there. I had relegated Hilda to the West Wing once again, and I'd had a decorator in to decorate a room for her, so mm. it looked something closely resembling home. Um, I was off on one. I was in a rage. If anyone had to come into the room, I would have hit them. I'm sure I would. I was drinking sherry and port. I had put away three bottles, and I was listening to Debussy, and it was frightfully delicious. Um, Sounds absolutely yummy. Well, it was for some time, until I was disrupted by hmm? unsavoury people. Oh dear. There was a knock on the door. Oh, dear. I thought, that's funny. I'm not expecting anyone. Commoners? You guessed it. I looked at the calendar. It was the 31st of October. That oh, no. dreaded fucking day. Oh, no. It was then, wasn't it? Halloween. I stumbled half drunk to the door. They knocked a second time. I said, OK, I'm coming, you tossers. <laughs> Open the door. There they were. Three diminutive working-class oiks, just as vampiric creatures of the oh. night. Oh, no, mister, I want to oh. suck your blood. I said, oh, oh, shut up. It's making me gag. But he says, trick or treat, mister. I rolled up a copy of The Guardian, mm. and I struck them with blows, left, right, centre, striking them, and Debussy played in the background. Good it was, choice of weapon. I felt like a conductor. Do, 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 striking them every time the symbol struck them. Conducting the pain. Yes, conducting, conducting pain, pain at every strike. Swines. At the tykes. The filthy little Conducting swines. agony. Conducting agony to the rhythm. Do, 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 do. I felt wonderful. Marvellous. Yes. And I pushed them to one side and said, Get out! Get out of my ground now! And I released the hounds and they were chased off. I too had an experience on Halloween. Halloween. What a stupid event. Yes. Knock at the door. Opened it. Three small, grubby little children. Mm. Dressed as werewolves. Oh, or some nonsense. Before they had chance to speak, I took a copy of this Sunday Times supplement, rolled it into a club shape, tight, beat them, shut the door, leaving them weeping in the, outside the door. A few minutes later, another knock at the door. I thought, cheeky little blackguards have come back for more. Oh, word. So I rolled up the Observer supplement magazine. Thicker. Thicker, heavier, more of a beating. <laughs> Opened the door. It was Carruthers, little boy and oh, girl. Oh, lovely little Carruthers. What were they dressed as? Oh, delightful. They were dressed as Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, wonderful. Oh, literary classic. Oh, very very classic. Oh, very marvellous. Magazine. Very cultured. Yeah, very so, cultured. Yeah. So, of course, I gave them a box of black magic each. Of course you did. And a Rolex watch. Oh, one each. Yes. And patted them on it and said, on your way, lovely, lovely. Oh, and, of course, the working class children lay at the side. Of course, they went. <laughs> you did right. They had it coming, the terrible little smelly working class children. One Tuesday afternoon, Stanford received the awful news that his daughter was agreeing to marry a member of the working class. Tis a pity she's a whore. Oh, I'm sorry about that. It's rather embarrassing. I got a little bit teary-eyed. Do you feel better now? Yes, I went into the bathroom and, um, you know, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, I'm better than this. Hmm. I don't need to get upset Which over of course it. you are. Which yeah. of course you are. I am. I made a quick phone call, <clears throat> you know, something to cheer me up. I had four people sacked, which means, naturally, that my annual salary has gone up by another hundred grand. Did this dry your tears? Instantly. Good. Instantly, immediately. Good, good. I'm glad you feel better. And I felt elevated, superior once again. I, I hope the people you had uh, fired wept. They did. Oh, I'd like to think so. They wept. They wept. They went. I I have a great love and respect of the royal family. Oh, you were saying? Mm. Yes. Yes, a love. Of I do. I mm. think they're the most worthwhile cause we oh, have. I was in the RAF with Charlie. Of course you were. Mm. Yes. Damn fine pilot. It's a delightful. I mean, they're delightful, <coughs> but I've met them numerous times. Of course. Oh, yes, so. yes. There were there was my daughter. Most of them was my daughter's wedding and being queen. Exactly. Sixty years and going strong. She's so brave. And I never spent a better penny than giving it to them to so they can live this life. And I, I admire the way mm. they go round 
they get driven around mm. and um, dressing in these clothes, and they shake people's hands and even you know, working class. Even that's just what I was about to say. Even the working class, and I admire them for that because I couldn't do it. I'm pleased oh, to no. see that she does wear two pairs of gloves though. When she yes, she them. does because she doesn't want to get mm. any infections. Infections from the dirty, yeah. filthy work. I mean. Class. Imagine shaking all those hands. I mean, they still. I'm sure they still work in coal mines. Mm. If mm. there's any still open, I'm good. Old, good old Maggie got a lot of most of those closed down. I know. Yeah, there's yeah. probably some in mm. some ghastly town in Yorkshire. Mm. There's probably some ghastly coal mine still going. Imagine shaking a hand with a coal mm. miner. Mm. Well, she helped rid Britain of quite a lot of the working class. Thatcher? Well, mm. yes, yeah. that Well, she got rid of them. The work. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> <laughs> now well, they're just the signing on class. <laughs> uh, I, went, I went to the theatre to yeah. see Macbeth. Oh! Mm. Frightful bad show. Bad show, eh? Mm. Sat down with the, with the wife. Yeah. Uh, just waiting for the show to start, I noticed two seat, two rows in front of me. A couple of my employees. Really? Sat in front of me nearer to the play than me. A couple of your staff? Yes. Closer to the yes. stage than you? Instantly I leapt. I bet you felt so seat. degraded. Grabbed them by the ear, made them swap seats, so that I and my wife were sat in front, front of, of them, them. Yes, in yes. the right place. You did right. Yes. I'd say well done to you for that. Uh, if you'd have been looking at the back of their head, they could have kept turning around smugly mm, throughout mm, the evening yes. and you'd have felt inferior to them and a boss should never feel inferior yes. to his peasants. In fact, I added to the situation. Mm. I sent Cadbury out to buy me a sombrero. To block their view? Which I wore through the whole first scene of Macbeth. To block their view. <laughs> yes. And did you turn and smile never. and taunt them? No, I just smiled to myself. Did you even watch the play? I could hear their sobbing. I could hear them weeping as they missed most of the play. <laughs> oh, delightful. Oh. delightful. I love that sombrero. I wear it in bed with the mistress. Oh, yes. Yeah. And think about my bed. Do you fire a pistol while you're at it? I say, when shall we three meet again? Like a Mexican sex bandit. <laughs> yes. Like a kind of fig roll. Yes. Maud, more drink? Oh, another one would be fantastic. Two more large whiskies, barman. I want to stumble out of this place. Yes. I won't be happy until I'm blind drunk. Makes making love to the wife more bearable. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Numbs the pain. <laughs> I told her so. Mm. I said, mm. you're a whore. Of course she wept. Oh, profusely. I have a, I have a, I did have a slight problem with my daughter. Yes, there was a problem sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She married a nice chap, you know, uh, Jimmy Edwards. Oh, son. Jimmy Edwards, delightful, delightful. We went to, uh, yeah. went to uh, Cambridge with him. Good breeding. Yeah, and, um, wedding, very fine wedding, in the yes. grounds, in a marquee. Yes. And uh, I went to visit them in their new home. Their new home? Mm -hmm. Delightful. Ah, this is where, this is where the um, shame comes in. My daughter was living in a, oh, a mere six-bedroomed hovel. A slum? A slum, a tiny little six-bedroomed little tiny place. Pokey little rabbit's well, warren, was it? No, I said, Jimmy, you're a fine chap. You took him to one side. But I cannot allow this. I, I made them move within a week to a decent house. Yes. But he's been a good son-in-law, but <coughs> the tiny pokey little oh, place he took my daughter to. The shame, eh? Mm -hmm. I dread to think what my Guinevere's ended up in. It must be some kind of semi-detached... Oh! Double. I don't know what it is. Oh! Maybe even a council house. Oh, oh man! <laughs> Please! Stop it! Stop! Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Stop! sorry you stand Stop! Stop! I'm sorry, Stanford. No! Don't weep, Stanford. <laughs> I need another drink. Barbara, get me another drink. Two more large whiskey. Oh, you. I hope you enjoyed our free audiobook of Reginald and Stanford. You can browse our other free titles, which also include A Pillock Story, The Life of David Cameron. Thank you.